All right, we're recording. Ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, it is your favorite show. It is Lessons Learned Along the Way. And today we have another special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest is a CEO. She's an entrepreneur. She's a doctor, you know. Today we have Dr. Natalie Bitature as our special guest. Natalie Bitature, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, it's 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 all it's our pleasure to even host you as as a guest on this platform. Um, first and f- first and foremost, it's like uh, customary. We have to ask our guest to share with our listenership, our viewership, um, their um, their introduction. Like, who are they, and and what do they do, and what do they want to um, share? You know, from the from sure. introduction. So. We can try to give you a brief overview, I guess, and intergenetic. Yep. <laughs> My name is Dr. Natalie Bitture. I'm a Ugandan social entrepreneur. I've worked across different sectors in Uganda over the last 10 years. Telecom, hospitality, real estate, construction, um, some in media now. And my career sort of bounced around because I have a family business, the Simba Group of Companies, where I work as the chief of staff. I also have my own personal companies, Handyman Uganda, Enegro, um, Musana Carts, and now the Her Initiative. And across my different businesses, what I like to do is I focus on impact. So I'm a social entrepreneur first and foremost, because I believe business has the power to do more for communities and to have a positive and lasting change on people and the planet. So that's my focus. My current project is the Her Initiative, which is a mentorship platform for women where I do one-on-one coaching. We have a Facebook group and some courses that help African women in their entrepreneurship journey and career development. I mean, that's very commendable. It's always good to empower um, the women in our society. Um, so where did this, um, How? What, what was the inception of this idea of the HAR project? Like, how did it begin and, and how did it start to move? It actually began quite organically. I find like I always start companies because I see a problem or um, a pain point in society and I feel like a company can solve this or a business can come up with the solution. And over the last like three or four years, working with Musana Card vendors, some of which were women, we had a charitable initiative called Project 500K, where we trained 5,000 young people in Uganda district in financial literacy and some business skills. And I just kept finding how especially in African culture, women are still behind men. We still don't speak up as much. We're still not given opportunities. We're still taken for granted. In the rural communities, women still need permission just to attend a financial training. And yet women are the backbone. Women are the ones who are saving money, who are paying kids school fees, looking after them when they're sick. They're the responsible ones who have many dependents. They're relatives, children. They're looking after homes and work, but they don't have the support and encouragement that they need. So when I looked at why have I become so successful as a woman in business in Uganda, and yet most women are struggling, and even the ones who are successful, who seem successful like me, we still face a lot of bias and a lot of lack of opportunities, or you're not wanted where you are, and you don't get the right support or encouragement because it's all tailored to men. And it was really frustrating. And more and more, I started taking um, young ladies who just send me messages on Facebook. Can I come and meet you for a quick chat? Can I get some advice? Can you guide me on my business? And I'd always say yes, because whatever little time I had while juggling the hotels or Simba or something else going on, I wanted to give back to women and support them. So it kind of just happened on its own. I ended up meeting a few girls a couple of times, then it became more and more. At the same time, I was doing a lot more public speaking for youth groups yeah. to also guide and encourage them about entrepreneurship and career development. And then about a year ago, I said, you know what, let's try and focus on just women. So I stopped taking appointments with young men and whatever time I had, I would focus on women to understand them better and what their challenges are and how I can support them. And you find the same sort of challenges across the board. Women from different backgrounds, ages, religions, careers, entrepreneurship, the rural areas, in the urban areas. And so I'm trying to tailor the information and the guidance and the community to support in business and see how they can reach their furthest potential and still live a balanced and whole life. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, um, I, I I really like that. I like the initiative. I like the whole um, 
model of what you're doing right now. I'm raising a daughter right now, and and I know it's it's a little different raising a daughter in the United States compared to raising a daughter in in Uganda、um, because of the cultural、um, indoctrinations that are put into your your child. Like you you may not even know it's maybe something that is innate even through your mother's or your grandmother's actions that. A girl child is supposed to act the same type of way and be submissive, and and even when it comes to business, you know,、um, just have a very、um, a very submissive role in business sometimes. And yet they are the backbone of everything. You know, women are the backbone of everything,、um, and they are not only the backbone, but they 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 spearhead stuff. They they're leaders in. In everything that we do in life, you know, in the household, like you know, in you know, from from my mother to 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 my to my my daughter's mother, you know, like I'm looking at the roles that women play, and I realize, like, yes, we live in a very misogynistic、uh, world. I will not only say in just the African community, even here in here in 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 America or in the UK, in, in you know, in the Midwest, the place I live, it's very misogynistic and it's very.、Um, It's very beneficial in weirdly, like the like it's a weird beneficial to be a, a male and it's unf- unfair.、Mm-hmm. I mean, to, to to many, you know, here we we there's this、um, there's the current、um, the current thing going on here is equal pay. You know, you may have the same、um, credentials, the same certifications, but for some reason, the man a man is getting paid more than a woman,、um, and it's I mean it's unfair. And to me, I, I really believe in. I'm, 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 I'm for the feminist、uh, movement. I'm for, I'm for the,、um, uh, the, the female empowerment movement. I'm for, I'm for all that because I understand it. I was raised by, m- by my mom and my dad, of course. I, but I was, I don't had sisters, and I, I don't think I'm better than them. And I don't think, I don't think I deserve a better. I don't know the exact word to say. I don't. I don't. I don't. You know. I don't. I don't view life like I am.、Um, I like I'm the beneficiary of everything, and they they just supposed to, you know, be my subordinates in any way. But、um, just I'm saying that to say this: raising up a daughter. I know culturally, socially, and even sometimes in school, you know,、um, people are socially engineered. Mentally to do stuff, and I'm saying that to say, with your her movement, knowing that you're taking this、um, this initiative, having to understand that sometimes in school, or sometimes at home, sometimes through our religion, sometimes through our tribal culture, these grassroots ideas of misogyny are implanted. How do you? How does that initiative, you know? Because sometimes this is okay. I'll start off this. I know this is a long tangent and to where I want to go, but I'll start off with a, a story about how they train elephants. Right? They get them as babies, put the locks on them, and then bolt them to the ground. And they try to pull their.、Um, they try to pull. I mean, this is sac- circus, circus,、uh, whatever you call it, circus in America, circus. But circus elephants, right? Uh, they train them by locking them down to a small pl- to、um, to they bolt them to the ground right, and they pull they they try to pull their leg off that bolt but they cannot as as calves as baby elephants right, as they get older, they unlock them they just put the lock on them but they don't bolt them and in their mind even though they're big and strong and they can break that bolt they still think like they're young, so that's that grassroot idea of. Inferiority. It's like that thing of like I cannot break this, but even though they can do it, they can break that that bolt. It's just been instilled into them as a child or as a, a calf that even in the circus, that's how they control them mentally, right? The same way as culture has been doing that too. And I love my culture, but I know our culture is very misogynistic. But now that can also be translated into business, into ownership. Into thinking that okay, yes, I may have capital, but I need a man to manage this, or you know, how how does the her initiative change that that weird embe- embedding of idea that has a, somewhat of a misogynistic feel to it? If I sorry for my long-winded explanation and drive. No, it's so good. 
you really get it and you see it and i'm very happy that you can say you're a feminist and you believe in it and you understand I, I, yes yes i i'm with the movement i'm with the idea i'm with the movement because it's true women are capable and we do deserve the same opportunities as men growing up with sisters you can see there is no reason that your sisters do not deserve the same opportunities that yeah. you have been given, right yeah so i love the um example you've given of the baby elephant it's exactly that and what i've seen is the number one challenge that african women have it's not about how much money they have or how much education or what they're trying to do the first problem is confidence and that's the exact metaphor that you've given it's because from the time that they are small girls they are taught to look after other people and they're taught to be quiet and they're taught that they're not good enough some man is supposed to be in charge some man is supposed to make the decisions when you walk into a room it must be the man who is in charge i can't tell you how many times people have walked into the similar offices and looked for the man when i am the person who's going to make the decision right and it's just a bias that we have naturally and culturally and we are still enforcing it in young girls today so the first thing we try to tackle in her is confidence it's not even about the capital that you have or what sector you're working in or the technical skills the first thing is you have to believe that you can do it and that's what i try to tell all the women that i meet and i feel like they know that they're capable they know that they have the answers they know what is good for their business or their career but they're too scared to admit it or to say it or to reach for it or to grab it or to ask for it mm. so the first thing you have to do is get them to believe in themselves because they are on the right track and they do deserve all these things they deserve to have companies they deserve to have the jobs that they want and to be paid right for it even when you look at statistics and surveys all over the world women are paid less women don't yeah. negotiate or women don't apply for jobs that they're not completely qualified for yet men apply for everything it's yeah. crazy to the comparisons but it's just because of the confidence that's instilled in us when we're children right. so that's the first thing that you have to break and it's so amazing when you see it happen because the more you encourage a woman and she starts to believe it and see it in herself the more risk she takes the more opportunities she takes the more changes that start to happen to her and then she's the first one to turn to other women and be like girl you can do it too yeah so it's so nice to have a supportive community and that's the first thing we do we put women in a space and that's why we don't allow men in the group because yeah. there's men in a situation the women start to back down they start to feel inferior even if the man is not doing anything just by his presence they feel like the man should speak it's his opinion that matters more so we have a women only space and then we encourage and that's when you can now start to give in skills technical things courses podcasts articles like information to make them feel like they know what they're talking about but you really need to break through the confidence first because women are so capable but it's heartbreaking the rate at which we think we're not yeah and and i feel like you know just speaking for um the women i know in my life um first of all I'll talk about uh my child's mother and what she does i i won't say maybe she's not into being <laughs> put out on my podcast and her business but uh she's very capable um she's in the medical field and she talks about this idea of imposter syndrome sometimes around men where you know she has all the capabilities but when she's around very confident people she feels like do I deserve to be here but when we have that when we have that pep talk you know me and her so i could get her riled up to you know let her know like you are if you're in a room you deserve to be there it's yeah. not you don't have to have the imposter syndrome where and and i, and I, I don't want to just you know designate this to only women even i have an imposter syndrome sometimes i'm like do i deserve this do i you know and we it's a mental mind f forgive my language but it's a mental thing that just messes with you sometimes where you don't feel like you deserve to be in that place but you have all the capabilities you have all the qualifications you have all the certifications and you deserve to be in there and i feel like that imposter syndrome is could be also like um trauma from childhood you know based on society and how uh society depicted people that look like you or depicted it on onto you you know because you're looking at you know my mom her place was here and she you know she was in the kitchen or that you know just weird so social um depictions of how a woman or how 
a man should be, you know, and 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 I can see that being a, an issue. But anyways, going to my next question, and you, you talked about this too. You talked about it doesn't matter what capital you have. The first thing that you guys work on is confidence. That's the first. Uh, that's the that's the first uh, foundation of your whole initiative and then build from that right so let's say we've built on the confidence right um a big thing that i i'm seeing right now especially post or uh, i would say post pandemic because that makes sense because we're still in the pandemic but after now that in, we're in pandemic uh era because <laughs> i don't want to say like era because it's not the renaissance era but pandemic era right um <laughs> uh we're in the pandemic time right mm-hmm. um getting capital or finding capital can be a challenge and this can kind of pull back all the initiatives that we are doing it can set us back with all the initiatives that we are doing especially with building confidence because i know there's a lot of mental health issues especially during this time mental health is is a, is, is a big big thing especially in the pandemic time right mm. or women all over the world even in Uganda in America i'm just saying how do you how does the har movement in Uganda or even you, you could translate that to another model here in America how would how do you help women find capital especially during these hard times because loans are not being given out because people don't you know if that makes any sense firstly loans are being given out if anything the banks want more customers right now because everything is being paused but historically we have a challenge as women in getting loans because firstly there's the confidence of course but then also because women don't own property or land in Africa it's culturally your fathers or your brothers and so we don't really have assets which has been a big barrier for us with when it comes to formal loans and lending development banks are working around that guarantees different grants foundations are trying to help us with that but typically when you are an entrepreneur especially as an african woman starting out there's like a process you have to go through so first it's always your savings because you can't ask someone for money to buy and invest in your dream when you haven't for yourself. So I tell women it's important that you save no matter how much you're making or how much you have or even if you're getting money from someone else, you need to sacrifice something in your own life to save towards your business because it will show you how much you want this business to work. Are you serious about it or you save for one week and you're like, "Ah, it's not worth it. I'd rather spend this money on my nails or my hair or food or my kids clothes or something else." You need to feel that pinch and feel that sacrifice as you save towards a goal. Right. Once you have savings, then you can approach someone you know. In America, they call it the friends, family, and fools round because right. you have to find someone who's not going to come after you badly if you don't pay them back. But right. more so, someone who knows you as a person. They can take right. a chance with you as a person, your character. They yeah. know, you, they trust you, they believe in you, and you can present your business idea to this person. Say, I've saved this much money. Can you match it? Can you help me out? Can you give me this much? Yeah. And sometimes it takes a couple of people if your business needs a lot of capital, but I encourage people to start with little so you start and you practice and you're risking a little bit. You don't want to use all your life savings and take out loan from four of your uncles and then <laughs> it's on and you're stuck. Right. So start small and start with what you've got and then once you've made your first sale, your first 10 sales, your first 12 sales and now capital, you really need the capital to grow the business. Yeah. That's when you need to be asking for money. Right. Not before you sold a product or you've even started. Start as small as possible, just sell one item or your service once so that you you know your service, you know if it works, you know if the market wants it, you know if your pricing is right. Because right. there you have a bit of a soft landing. It's not so much money, if something goes wrong, you can apologize to your friend, your mentor, your parents, whoever you borrowed the money from. and they'll understand it won't be the end of the world right it's once you pass that stage where your business is successful enough that you quit your job or you bored a couple of times and paid it back now you are getting bigger you're moving that's when you can look for grant applications because there's so much soft money we call it that's yeah. coming into africa that wants to support women in business that's when you can go to like different avenues that are more formal like angel investors mm. and all before you apply for bank loans by the time mm. you get to a you really need to have an established business you need to have been doing this for 3 or 5 years you need to have audited accounts you need to have staff like you need to have your paper trail all in line you've been paying people taxes. pay attention 
Natalie is dropping gems right now. Keep going, <laughs> Natalie. Sorry, I just I had to let my oh, yeah. viewership pay attention because I have a lot of hip hop musicians and and creatives. But please pay attention to what Dr. Natalie is saying right now. <laughs> Keep going. For women, even creatives, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So many people just jump into business, or you had a side hustle, and now it's growing really right. big. It's a really great thing. A business is really freeing. Mm-hmm. It can open so much opportunity for you, bring you so much more income than a job could if you do it consistently and it's hard so i also don't say everyone jump into business you need to know it's a it's a marathon a really really long one there are going to be a lot of hard times and you're going to have to be really resilient but that's why understanding the money flow and systems and knowing what to expect is really helpful you really need to be prepared before you start the business do lots of market research know the competitors that are out there know how much people are paying for this know the value of your product or service to your customer and know your customer who is your typical customer right. if your customer are, are fellow women that you meet in the gym but you're advertising on billboards on a main road that's not exactly useful right you need to make sure you're matching what your customer wants what they, the way that they communicate whether it's social media or billboards or flyers or phone calls and you need to be able to connect to them person to person yeah i think that's something that also gets taken for granted a lot but this is all in support of growing your business and you shouldn't look for formal money and think oh now I'm a big business person I need to go to the bank the bank has a hefty like a hefty process to get through right. so you need to know what to expect when i say you need to have audited accounts that's a must they won't even look at you if you don't have things like that you need to know that you've been paying your taxes that everything is filed correctly right. many people i don't hear especially in uganda have businesses for years they've never incorporated the company they've never paid taxes yeah. they don't know what nssf is that yeah. they have 20 employees and yeah. you can slip under the radar sure but there's also a benefit to going through these processes to understanding why they're in place how it protects you how it protects your staff what benefits it can open up for you in future because if you've been running for 10 years and now you really need a bank loan but you've never done any paperwork you're going to have to start from scratch and come back to the bank in 3 years once you've had audited accounts and tax returns and things like that so as an entrepreneur educate yourself that's why after the confidence you need the skills you need the actual technical know-how you need to know what you need to know before you dive in because it's not just a walk in the park it's not just oh i'm good at this drawing i can design t-shirts that's a good thing to have a passion a talent something you're interested in but you also need the technical side of business that's underrated in our african culture it seems like everyone is an entrepreneur here as a side hustle even if they have a job or they're an entrepreneur even if it's informal but to go the distance and to have a business that lasts you really do need to know and take time to educate yourself and prepare yourself on the process that it is to be an entrepreneur because right. any real business takes 10 years before it, it's like truly successful yeah. it's going to be a full roller coaster for the first 10 years before you know your company really well you know your customers you know your product or your service and that's when it's clear sailing and you can blow up but the first yeah. 10 years is a struggle that's why i tell people it's a marathon yeah. so you have to be sure and you have to really want it and then get yourself immersed in the process yeah wow that was that was so much so much so wisdom much shared i appreciate you i appreciate you for you know just sharing that with on my platform and, and hopefully we all including myself absorb that content that you just you know put on onto us here i mean it's it's very enlightening it's very um it's, it's educational it's something that you know we all need to know i mean um talking about small businesses talking about people that are trying to have um have a proof of con- uh, concept and they're trying to move forward with an idea how to move and how to strategically move the right way uh, talking about ideas talking about starting businesses um i'm very interested in because I, i always talk about this before corona and after corona right um before corona I had a five year plan i mean before covid-19 i had a five year plan right my five year plan i wouldn't put it i wouldn't put it out there because i like to keep it on my vision board by myself where i can look at it and may hold myself accountable i mean i'll put it out there i'll let it the people that would know my five year plan are people that will be my account uh, accountability people right but um i didn't really think through my five year plan because i didn't think about pandemic situations i didn't think about these i before i would say a minor hiccup but now it's a major hiccup 
and it's going to affect the economy after corona how do we as content creators as creatives in general as business creators as small business um, people who want to start small businesses what you as a business strategist you as a ceo you as an entrepreneur what what things would you advocate for especially in uganda i'm i'm, I'm focusing on uganda africa f- to be pandemic proof and i know pandemic may not be the only thing that to be an obstacle they the other things maybe um you know natural weather we don't have tornadoes in uganda but like earthquake something natural has you know like what what can we what can you share with people to like something that is proof of all these things that could happen that are un- unav- you, you know you cannot avoid them or i mean you can't stop them from happening like as a business person what how uh share with us like ideas or business ventures that you would advocate people to do i guess that's my question um with insurance companies they always call it act of god if you look mm-hmm. at the contract these kinds of events like i think normally they mean earthquakes and tornadoes earthquake, and things. yeah but i feel like a pandemic it's like it's act of god as well there was no one who was prepared for this or who planned for it so everyone has had to pause which is the first thing and reassess i think now that we're down to august if this was march or april and we're having this conversation i got a lot of requests at the time what should people do what businesses and i was like i'm not i'm not going to comment i can't direct people down the wrong path i don't feel Absolutely. Like because we didn't know at the time it was happening so fast it was two weeks of lockdown which became a month which became five months which became worldwide global crisis so i feel like at this point i'm comfortable to say the first thing is always to pause Mm. It's so great to have a 5 year plan. I love that. You have a 5 year plan, you have a vision board, you have accountability buddies. You are good to go. I have no worries for you. I'm not stressed for you. You will figure it out. What is key is not holding on to your 5 year plan and saying, "Okay, this year doesn't count. I'll just move on from next year." Mm. That's not as an entrepreneur, something that's important to us is the word pivot. You have got to be able to adjust, to be flexible. Actually today I was writing on Twitter how you have to know where you want to go how you'll get there you leave it up to god because there are many different paths and routes and you can't say this is the only way i'm going to get there because life will always throw different things at you it might not be as big as a pandemic mm. but there will be small obstacles that change you go left instead of right so you have to go around it's okay mm. what you need is the resilience and the goal the vision to know where you actually want to end up mm. so right now while there's a pandemic what can you do to adjust because it's not just a pandemic where we're all going to be trapped in our houses for 6 months and then everybody's out and it's fine mm. no the truth on the ground is especially in africa this is probably going to be for the next 2 years mm. it's not going to be business as usual everything has to change but mm. what people are saying this is the new normal and that's the mindset that we need to get our heads around because right. life has to go on so you can't say oh i used to have a shop in a mall and now it's a pandemic so i have to close the shop and be mm. given up no Sure, my the mall might be closed for the next six months, but you're still an entrepreneur. You still understand what your shop right. is selling. How can you still get to your customers? How can you work within the new standard operating procedures? How can you make sure it's safe and your customers still know you're open and they still get access to your information and they still have access to your product? You pivot. Mm. You have to be flexible. It's not that there's one sector that is pandemic proof and another that is not. We work in in medical services now but also in hospitality. So I sit in board meetings where we're looking at the next year. We had a scenario planning meeting last week. The hotels are not going to be up to capacity for the next 2 years. That's mm. a fact. Yes. So we have to plan and see how we can keep running, how we can keep people employed, how we can continue to provide a service while this pandemic is going on. Right. We're in the medical staff say they're just trying to ramp up as fast as they can they can meet the demand which is a challenge it's a good challenge they, they understaff the rest yeah they understaff they have to import things they have to uh, expand the machinery the storage the distribution so there's always different challenges and a pandemic is a good lesson for entrepreneurs this is the worst case scenario where everything has to change yeah but always be changing life is never stable and secure it's fluid it's in motion So you have yeah. to stay flexible and adjust. I don't know yeah. your business as well as you know your business. Right. You know what your customers appreciate about your business. Right. How do you 
that going in this new circumstance that's what you have to focus on yeah you said something that is so profound you talked about hospitality and you were comparing it with um with 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 the medical field and um looking at the um adjacent or just putting them side to side um I say I just did but anyways I meant I meant something else but putting them side to side and using verbiage right you're using the verbiage of hospitality and hospital and just seeing how the traffic is moving from this end to that end in a pandemic situation it's still hospitable hospitable and I'm I'm not trying to break down the greek meaning or the the <laughs> but it's 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 interesting how things are moving like it's like It's, it's a it's the how the pendulum is swinging and I, I it's interesting i mean that's very interesting and it's very profound that what you said there that is giving me a different concept and an idea that is for another podcast but uh for this particular uh episode for this particular podcast we are here to celebrate dr dr natalie taturi um in 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 my assessment of things here in the united states it's safe to say we are living in in times that will be documented and they're going to be documented in a way that they're just not going to be documented to be passed by but documented to look at these times as chronological land you know landmarks or or time stamps in time right 2020 2020 is going to be looked at as a big time stamp where a lot of things are going to change The first thing I'm talking about here in the United States is the death of brick and mortar buildings, school systems like people having to go into schools and sit into classrooms and they, and as I'll tell you here in the United States going into offices it's very expensive to have a uh, custodianship uh paying for the lights paying for the servers like the internet servers paying i mean internet servers not servers like, but like the internet network the networking side of things with the IT the IT people uh, paying for security because we live in you know, I live in I live in the midwest where people can you know there's active shooters everywhere who <laughs> get angry get fired out of their job and they come and you know start blasting so you're not paying for security you're not paying for all these different things you're not liable to be sued if someone hurt, hurt themselves during um during work so now people are working from home it's cheaper for some of these businesses to have people working from home and statistics are showing that people are being more productive working from home and that's why i'm saying it could be the death of the brick and mortar and that can also be translated in the educational field where having a professor in a classroom or having people doing classes online i mean even though it's not i don't know about the numbers in the educational field but i know for businesses some people most most businesses are going to have people not work five five day a week type of uh, schedules they'll be working four days within the week and maybe having a day working from home because they realize it's cheaper and it's more productive for the employee i mean for the employee and the employer right yeah. um i don't know how that will translate in uganda because i don't i don't know how online school even is working in uganda right now uh, how <laughs> how efficient it is and how because we are so embedded in in that in that old school brick and mortar you know you have to go to the mall you have to go to the restaurant it's not the e-commerce is not a big thing like having to have people deliver food outside your door or having uh you to order stuff i don't we don't use amazon do we use amazon in uganda i've no, i've but never but, but it's the Cuba. thing Mm. Yeah, but yeah, you it's, it's a whole thing. I, like growing up in Kampala, it was a big deal waking up, dressing up and going to buy something. Like going to your stores like Simba Telecom to look for phones and and you know, go through a catalog of phones and trying them out and see how, you know, what what functions it has. I mean, the e-commerce is I don't think it's a big thing, but um Do you think the death of brick and mortar is a real thing in in Uganda or you think we're still we're still we're good the brick and mortar is 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 still doing its thing in the business side of things You know I've been trying to keep up pace to what's happening around the world it's been very interesting I have friends in San Francisco who 
are now working from home and San Francisco is one of the most expensive places to live in the world. So they've given up their rent in San Francisco, moved to the next state, Utah or Nevada mm-hmm. or something where your rent is so much cheaper. You have way more space because you're not needed in the office. Right. And so many big companies now have said you don't need to, to come into work till next year once they're sure. Right. I see how in America it has made a huge difference. People are they're saving so much. They're worried about office buildings and what that's mm. going to look like. Internet, yeah. Stadium, stuff like that. So there's different challenges. I agree with you where Uganda, we just don't have the infrastructure at the moment that e-commerce has taken off. There are companies like Jumia that are doing great. They've been growing slowly and now because of the pandemic, they've had to like um, up what they're doing so much more. Cafe Javas is doing so well. They had a, I saw an episode of BBC about African businesses. They're, they've moved completely digital, touchless. They have an app, you order, everything gets delivered by a Boda Boda. It's so efficient. So we do have the appetite for it. And what it makes me think of is leapfrogging. Mm. Like, you know, we have mobile money here and yes. America doesn't have that. Yeah. They only have like Venmo now, which only Venmo, came in the last few yeah. years. It's the closest thing. And Cash thing. App, I think. Yeah, to mobile Cash money. Up, yeah. But we've had mobile money for years. And so in so many ways, everyone says Africa is behind. That's true. We don't have electricity like in other countries. We don't have internet everywhere. When we had to send staff home, a lot of them can't work from home. They just don't have right. reliable power. They don't have internet. It's just not possible. Yeah. So we have challenges like that. But at the same time, this pandemic has forced everyone to leapfrog. The way we got mobile money and we started operating in a digital space ahead of all Western countries is right. the way I think we have the opportunity to jump past this brick and mortar stage that most mm. countries do. We can all just switch now straight to e-commerce. That girl in, a, um, in the mall who has a clothes shop, she was already sending posters of all her clothes on WhatsApp. Yeah. So right now, she just gets to save on rent. Keep the clothes at your home in, a, in the boxes and Absolutely. deliver by People will still be able to get your product. What Absolutely. we have to do is push for infrastructure to improve because that's what's holding back the e-commerce ability. It's not that people don't want, it's not that we don't understand. It's that we can't because the power goes out, because the internet is so expensive. There are small things that are not at the people's control that the institutions need to improve and then we can move forward into e-commerce. But what it has shown us is when people are forced, they adjust. All these old government people or people who work in NGOs or like CEOs. My own father has learned how to use Zoom, Microsoft Teams, <laughs> but logging for himself. Right. He's handling it. I've been using Zoom for more than a year now because mm. I always had meetings across the world. But most people in Uganda love meetings. We shall meet next week. Okay. And you'll go through 10 meetings before something is done. <laughs> but not everyone, Let's course, meet to meet next time. <laughs> Let's have a meeting to meet again. <laughs> We meet about the next meeting. It's Let's crazy. Meet <laughs> Everyone is now forced to be more efficient. You can't have a six-hour meeting on Zoom. <laughs> right. It's just not possible. I keep having technical difficulties. And it's forcing all the generations, rigid people, everyone to adapt, to learn. You can do things more efficiently. We're using email more. We're using WhatsApp more. We're using right. Zoom more. And it's forcing people to become more digital, which is the future everywhere in the world. Right. So I'm grateful for that for Africa. We do need to put pressure on our governments, on our institutions, on our service providers to provide better services at a more affordable rate because people need them. Yeah. And that's how we will push and e-commerce will move forward faster. Yeah. Well said, well said. Um, yeah, I, even thinking about the space of... Of, that we are living in especially when we talk about the great equalizer which is the internet you know back then we could not compare and contrast situations like of development whether it comes to uh, technology but the internet just kind of makes everything an even playing field uh looking at e-commerce right i see boutiques in uganda promoting stuff through instagram just like people here in america do and you see like they have their pictures yeah. and they're slowly but surely transitioning to e-commerce without the um exchangeable factor when it comes to money because they've not developed maybe a tool an app to do it but they have the instagram posts where they'll post a picture of what they whatever the, whatever items they're selling and they'll say come to this location for the brick and mortar but you can buy it online and i'm like wow we're so efficient that way. You yeah. know, Uganda, in so many ways, is even all easier. the tools that we have, yeah. 
there's always a border who can pick and drop because the traffic to right. move around doesn't make sense yeah. so it's because of the internet people are struggling even when you look at ugandan um social media influencers when you look at Kenya or Tanzania, their followers are so many more because yeah. they just have more people online because yeah. internet is cheaper in Kenya and Tanzania. Right. So for example, Zari has more than 10 million followers on Instagram and it's because her, most of her base is in Tanzania. When right. you look at Uganda, it's very difficult <clears throat> for a Ugandan influencer to reach 1 million. Mm. I think we have Kenzo as number one as Uganda and he's probably around there. But it's so difficult because our people are not on Instagram. The MDs right. that it takes, there's only a million Ugandans on Instagram out of 40 million people. Right. So it's impossible when this is your market. But that is a challenge of infrastructure. It's not that the people yeah. don't want it or they don't understand it, yeah. which is a common misconception, misconception. But once we have the infrastructure and it's affordable, then it will become more widespread. Because yeah. when you go down to villages, people have WhatsApp, people have Facebook. They know yeah. how to use it. Yeah just that it's expensive so instead of being on facebook 10 times a day like people in the western world it's once a week but they ten, have it ten, ten, ten times is a very small amount compared, <laughs> i mean <laughs> right? but that addiction is the same in <laughs> it's the same things yeah. that everyone wants to see and feel and connect it's just our infrastructure right now that has not yet caught up yeah well said um so let's <clears throat> let's pull back and focus back on um Dr. Natalie Bitature. So, Natalie, uh, Natalie, sorry. Um, who are your biggest influences? Who Who are the people in your life or from from that you've seen that influence you to do what you're doing? It's a good question. Um, I think it's important to have mentors. I really stress this most of the time when I speak. I think I've been blessed to have very good mentors. My father has always been an excellent mentor for me. He always wanted the best for me. He never treated me like a girl, essentially, and said I could not handle something or I should not be somewhere. So he'd always teach me and bring me along and let me see and touch and ask questions. And he really encouraged that. So I think that's been a big blessing in my life, that that was encouraged and not stifled. So I, I give back a lot of what I am is so much like him. And so much I've learned from him. And now as I get older, we argue about so many different things, but he still always pulls something out and impresses me with how he knows something or did something different or so thought about it from a different angle, even when I feel like I know him so well. So I've been very lucky to have him as a mentor. And he's a very big risk taker. He never has to wait for the the crowd or for everyone to be doing something. He doesn't mind being the first one to try. If it fails, it fails. But he's gonna try. And I think that's something that has really helped his success throughout his career and so it's something he instilled in me that you don't have to wait for everyone to think it's a good idea you can just jump in and try something mm. it's an attitude that he has and i think that really influences the way i think because the kind of challenges i see when i'm starting a company for example other people see it too but they don't feel like they're the most qualified or they should be doing this or they should solve the problem and i always feel like let me try if I help a couple of people, great. It doesn't work, right. it doesn't work. Right. So I think that's really helped me and it's helped me also to move through different sectors and understand on a broader scale. I think Elon Musk is the first one who's been advocating for people to not focus only on your one sector and your technical skill and go super right. deep in it. It's good to know a lot about many different things because then you have a different perspective that's more whole and you can see things from different angles. So my dad is very much like that and he gets criticized a lot because he's in so many different sectors and he never thinks of it as a bad thing because he'll spend an hour talking about agriculture and then he wants to talk about mining and then he's like in a finance meeting and then he's on a board of an insurance company and he knows the sector for each of them very well because he likes to move through them and learn and also i think he's a very humble person he wants to hear from other people he wants to know what someone else thinks and he doesn't think he knows everything all the time so i think that approach has also really influenced me and it's the same approach i like to have when i'm because i'm also always thrown into situations that i'm not i never feel ready for a position that i've given and it's usually just thrust upon you all of a sudden you have to figure it out but the more and more that has happened the more i'm confident in my ability to figure things out you listen you learn you pick up from the people who've been doing longer than you and you put the pieces together in a different way. Right. So 
really influenced me and i think a lot of my style in business comes from him yeah and then i also like to follow what women around the world are doing because i feel a connection to other women and i think even if you're in one of the most advanced cities in the world women are having the same struggles as the women that we have here some might be more pronounced some might be more obvious but we go through so much of the same and i was lucky enough to stumble across ariana huffington when i was still in uni so i would read everything she'd say and write her books her blog her twitter her everything i listened to her podcast or interviews because her perspective on stuff is what i appreciate she's such she could be she's so much she is so much but she's not arrogant about it and she's not aggressive about it i feel like for me she was the first woman who behaved like a woman in business and was rewarded for it hillary clinton always breaks my heart when she lost that election my god it cut me deep because i feel like she fought so hard and she played the game the way women are told you have to play it which is mm-hmm. to behave like a man you never see her in dresses you never see her being all soft and kind she has to be tough she has to keep up with the boys and i feel like when i was younger that's the attitude i had i thought to succeed like the men you have to behave like the men so mm-hmm. i was a tough boy and i was quite aggressive and even the way i dressed and the way i acted and you feel like you have to be like that but when i came across ariana huffington it completely changed the way i saw the world you can be yourself you can be and have all these feminine qualities and you can still succeed and that's what she does and she continues to do today and she's so compassionate she's so open minded she's just she inspires me every week she sends a newsletter every friday with the stuff that she's reading or found interesting or quotes and every week i'm like wow Wow. because she leads with such dignity and grace she's never trying to be something she's not she's not apologizing for not fitting the norm she's not trying to fit in with how everyone else is doing it she has a movement where she tells women repeat your outfits i can't wear a different outfit every time i'm going to be Absolutely. photographed it's not sustainable i don't have money to waste like that and she encourages other women in business to do that i was like oh my god ariana i'm really struggling with this that's so smart yeah. and She just says it and does it and lives it and nothing bad happens to her. Yeah. So I feel like for me that was a big lesson. When you follow other women who are in your field in different countries, whether there's women in Zimbabwe who I follow on LinkedIn or women in Asia who are going through what we go through so much, mm-hmm. they're just a few years ahead of us. Women in the states in Europe when you see the women in Iceland and how much further along their society is in the way that they treat them and respect them, it's you you feel so connected and I feel like I'm inspired and i feel like re- it's relatable and you also learn so much from that mm. from other women and how they're going through things so i think other than my dad that's what influences me a lot i really like to keep up to see how other women are handling things of course it's great to read what jeff bezos is doing you know or zuckerberg and you see them in the news mm. but i i feel disconnected from that so it's good to read and keep up praise but it's when i hear and see other women and what they're going through and how they're handling these things that I feel like I need to listen to this I need to understand when I read Sheryl Sandberg's book Lean In I was like so it's not just me right <laughs> I feel very alone in my I struggle right. and I was like oh my gosh yeah. it it helps you so much to feel that connection and it helps to inspire you to pick you up when you're down to teach you a different way to do something a new perspective and I think that influences me a lot and I try to be that way for other African women as well so that when a girl somewhere is being pushed in a box or being told she's not enough or she should behave another way she should be able to say Natalie did it this way and she succeeded so i can do it too so if that's all i get to be i'm happy to do that for other african women yeah i mean the concept of relatability is very strong i mean being uh, an image or a symbol of hope to people is amazing i mean whether it's being the first person of you know the first woman to be president or be the first black woman to be the ceo of the major companies and first you know that that symbolism and the idea of relatability goes a long way because you're the you become the the symbol the voice and the blueprint of the hopeless you know or not, i don't want to say the hopeless but in, in that way but well, quite that, close so, almost yeah, hopeless I didn't, I didn't, i've never seen that so Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you. And shout out to your dad. I, and I pray 
that one day my daughter talks about me like the way you talk about your dad and his amazingness i mean you're you you turned out to be very great <laughs> he did a good job um <clears throat> thank you um talking about um we talked about symbols right let's talk about and right now I'm moving away from the script of my questions because you just we annihilated all the questions on my on my question list. We we went in depth, but let's talk about um your passions, right? I know you, her is a passion project or a passion uh, uh besides that like if if Natalie is not at task or not at work, what what, what would Natalie be doing? <laughs> If she's right. not if she's not right. doing her CEO work, she's not working on the heart. Like what's, what's Natalie doing? I am a I, I confess I'm quite the workaholic. It's something I'm personally trying to recover from right now and not work as much as I, I used to. And it's nice to think about that. I actually sat there and I thought, what do you like to do? We have to make a list of fun activities that are not work so I can keep myself busy doing other things. Um I really like learning from other people's stories. I realize I like watching documentaries or reading autobiographies, even sometimes just a movie about someone's life because human beings are so interesting. We're so different, yet we're so similar at the core of it. The things that drive us, the things that we're scared of. It's so amazing to see someone's journey and what makes someone different from others, what made them succeed, what made them fail, their choices, how they pick themselves up. So I really enjoy those kinds of stories. I really enjoyed The Last Dance. That was my favorite one here so far. Um it was a great it was series. Intense. <laughs> yeah. It was like intense. they I'm like the highs and the lows and the why behind yeah. it and that's how you tell a story. Ultimate like competitor that, right uh, there. Yeah, cuz it's a story worth telling. Yeah. These are really people like Michael Jordan who go down in human history. And yeah. his story is something that's worth sharing and they captured it so well and I really enjoyed I enjoy things like that. That I'm happy to take time off work and sit and like watch something like that. Yeah. Um I do read a lot. I like learning. I'm a little nerd at heart. Mm. So You're not a little like, nerd. You're a big nerd. <laughs> I'm a big nerd. <laughs> always studying, always yeah. like I mean which is good. You know, you're sharpening your tools all the time. So Yeah, so I'm a, I don't know. Sometimes I think it's bad because it's tied to work, but I'm always doing like an online course and reading certain articles or certain journals and books and trying to learn more about a certain field and I feel good when I'm learning. When I'm not doing anything, I I I kind of feel a bit empty and I keep like I like the learning process and I like to be pushed and challenged to see more and grow more. And I think it helps because I've been put into so many different sectors. You really have to learn quickly. So I think that's one of now my natural strengths is I can learn something really quickly and absorb it and like immerse and go for it. And it's something that I do a lot in my free time. I make sure I'm always learning. I think my other passion is music, my final one. Hmm. Yeah. Music is a big genre. Part. Or is it you don't have any genre? Oh, You're not genre oh, specific. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I, I music is a big part of my life, I think. Yeah. Me attract the life. I really enjoyed the stay at home concerts. That's how I spent a lot really? of time in town. <laughs> yeah, and, I did on YouTube. I watched so many different people performing in their houses. It was so much fun. Yeah. I mean, it's just does it take away that 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 feeling of live energy? I mean, I've not been to yeah. a a stay at home concert. I just I, I the whole concept of entertaining there remotely is weird. <laughs> it's so strange, I won't lie, but I saw a stand up. You don't get that many live concerts for like right. international artists. So I go to like concerts here all the time, but and there's nothing that can replace a live concert. Yeah. But it's about the music and the energy and the vibe and it's almost more intimate when they're at home. They're kind of goofy and like yeah. themselves. It's a bit more raw. It's not all fancy. Right. So it's different, but it's still nice. It's the same music musicians I find are like athletes. Yeah. So there's something in them that has to come out like this light and yeah. it comes out they're performing when they're doing what they're doing. It's like watching Michael Jordan play basketball. Right. So I just enjoy that experience. Yeah, I mean, the audience is the it's amazing. It's an amazing add on on element that audience because I attended a stand up a, a stand up comedy session on Zoom and you could see the comedian was kind of off with his timing because there was no audience like 
audience reaction <laughs> in the room is different from yeah. via you know like through zoom where you're looking at you know heads just looking at you and you know having <laughs> to see everyone's reaction and having you know because comedians make jokes of people that walk into the room like look at that guy with a you know green shirt we, 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 you know but you cannot do that whether when you forgot in your set or your your routine but it's it's interesting how and this is the new normal by the way so I, I have to adjust to it as an audience member but um i mean i'm not complaining i like staying at home but uh yeah it's interesting for entertainers oh, the truth i feel for like athletes i think there've been a couple of football matches and now even the nba is up and running without audiences Honestly, yeah. and i feel like for them that must be really hard yeah. because I make videos so when I record the video I'm by myself there's no pressure I can just talk and I've started doing lives since the lockdown which is a bit more pressure but what I find is I'm not as stressed because there's only a couple people on live but then if you come back a couple of days later hundreds of people have watched it right. so there's the same pressure you still have to perform at that level without the energy that you feel from a live audience so I think as performers it's going to take some adjusting because you still have to get into that space that flow and that like right space for your performance without the energy that you get from a live audience that can't come through in a screen i feel like it kind of comes through but in like a much less it's like having the volume really low down it's right. just not the same you can hold on to a little bit because i've been in like zoom um webinars i think i was in a deepak chopra one oh. and we were like 200 people on the zoom but there was like a moment where you we felt connected like what he was saying was so profound like it was quiet and we were all like captured so it can come through there are moments you can have that through technology maybe it's human spirit and human energy that's going to have to adapt and travel the world through these technology and devices whereas we used to be able to feel that you know you can feel the vibes in the room when you're like performing when you're at a concert if you just have that energy and we have to see how to get that through this technology because not only is it the new normal for the next year or two years now that we've seen it's possible i think it's going to continue to grow in all fields so it's something we just have to adapt to and learn yeah well said are we coming to the conclusion of this episode but before we go we always ask our guest to share um first of all share their ideology that helps them wake up and do the tasks that they do every day my ideology is open to everything attached to nothing meaning Ooh. i'm open to learning i'm open to um to i'm open to any idea that anyone will bring to my table right i'm attached to nothing knowing that anything can happen pandemic um anything can be taken away so i'm open to anything attached to nothing natalie what is your um what's the philosophy what's the I- ideology that keeps you going i love yours i feel like you are ready for this <laughs> that was your ideology before <laughs> um my philosophy i feel like is deliverance This is a word me and my friends came up with one night at a party funnily enough but deliverance is trusting that things will work out trusting that you have a bigger purpose and that you will get there and you will fulfill what you're supposed to fulfill in this life so it's about believing in something and knowing you'll get there not having doubt about it not knowing how you'll get there but knowing that you'll get there knowing that you'll succeed if you put your mind to something and your energy to something just put in some effort and believe that it can happen that it's real and that it can happen for you and it will happen the yeah. universe will find a way yeah. and it's a big thing about everything i do i have to understand what i can do and what i want and then let's see how we get there is it a play on uh, uh believing and delivering Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm assuming uh, optimism is the fuel. Um so mm-hmm. um finally you know this uh whole show is based on lessons learned along the way. Uh would you want to conclude this with some of the lessons that you've learned along the way? Sure. Um number one lesson I feel like for young people especially especially in Africa on top of that. Although everywhere don't give up and don't let other people's 
energies and opinions discourage you mm-hmm. you have to keep getting up there's no life without failure without falling but you have to keep getting back up you have to keep trying because the world needs us the world needs the ideas the energy the enthusiasm of young people there's so much value put on older people wiser people these big ceos big job titles but you know what they were also young once and it was their energy and enthusiasm when they were young that got them to be who they are today so i don't want our young people face so much pressure so many challenges so many choices the mental health crisis around the world don't be discouraged everyone is going through what they're going through but we need each and every one to like give their part do their part contribute participate engage because we need you and we need everyone's light that they have within them to come forth and to keep changing and transforming the world well said uh ladies and gentlemen there's been another great episode of lessons learned along the way with our special guest dr natalie bitatore we appreciate you for sitting down or standing up depending on how you receive this audio or visual we appreciate you for uh staying and listening to us all the way thank you again dr natalie bitatore for joining us we appreciate you ladies and gentlemen we are out bye <laughs>